Ahead in Time is a proper throwback to the 90s era 3D platformer, with a bit of interesting influence from later titles like Psychonauts. It's a game that keeps you on your toes and changes up the formula on you in surprising ways, but it does seem to suffer from a lack of coherent identity, with some obviously cut ideas being left to stew within. The game overall is still a fun and charming collect em up platformer, with plenty of interesting story elements and characters to make this fairly short adventure more than worth your time and money. But that's not all you want to hear, is it? A Hat in Time is probably one of my favorite games that I've played in a while, and it's one of the few that I bother to 100% in both its game and Steam achievement content, so I'll just go ahead and say that it has the merit of checking out, but if you're not the spoiler-concerned type or just want to hear why, I'll get into it now. I will say, though, that my second run through the game wasn't quite as magical as my first time, though. I didn't really have much interest in A Hat in Time, like, beyond, hey, this game looks neat when it was making circles around the Kickstarter gems crowd. Despite that, I decided to pick it up at launch and, holy crap, I was into it. I feel the game had a bit of a slow start and a slight learning curve, but when it clicked, it clicked hard. And for a while, I liked this game a bit more than Super Mario Odyssey. Hey, I 100%ed Odyssey too, so if you can get over my previous blasphemous statement, I'll let you know that my love for Hat in Time did not hold up as well as it did for Odyssey, but it's not like I'm playing either game constantly right now. As is apparently a requirement for the collect em up, this game has one of the brightest and most colorful palettes and graphic styles. It's fully 3D with all the camera wrestling that that'll entail. In fact, I don't remember having a fight with the camera this much during my first playthrough. Lately it seems I'm just constantly trying to dislodge the camera from the back of Hat Girl's head, and certain levels feel almost unplayable at times. It's not exactly early ukulele levels, but it does come about with that N64 level of unfamiliarity with the camera placement. It just seems odd in a modern game. The game also seemed to really hate me streaming it, as running OBS action and the game made parts seem to chug when I don't remember it running all that poorly initially. I even had a few friends with admittedly potato computers completely unable to run this game while getting Fortnite to passably work. I have no idea what's going on here with the optimization, but it's not normally this bad. The game's music is, well, probably among the best part of the game, and before you say, well, what else did you expect from Grant Kirkhope, I would say, fair enough, but he didn't compose the game. What? He didn't? Kirkhope composed, like, one track, and the rest were composed by... Oh boy, uh, Pascal Michael Stifel, who did such amazing work that I'd easily say it outshines Kirkhope's very distinct but still fantastic work. Tracks are distinctly eclectic, too. First area tracks seem more lighthearted, fitting the area perfectly by combining a tropical sound with some mafia era jazz. I can't think of anything better to illustrate an island inhabited by Russian mafia seafood chefs. Area 2's tracks blend mystery, western, and dance tracks. I know this sounds like a complete mess, but Pascal pulls this off to brilliant effect. The sound is also fitting of the genre and this era of gaming, but with better productions behind it, including voice acting for almost every line in the game. Even the normally silent hat girl has some voice acted lines beyond grunts, though I feel a lot of this leads to that overall feeling of cut ideas, as having her suddenly yell, DOWN WITH THE MAFIA is jarring to some extent, while the rest of her lines are just single word exclamations. It's obvious she has a personality, as you can find in diary entries and how she deals with a character later on, so leaving her as a semi-silent protagonist seems weird and lacking. While the game is pretty much the other throwback tribute to the 64-era collectathon, there's a lot more to it that improves upon the formula, taking pages from the gameplay-altering and story-heavy chapter system of Psychonauts. With that, there's still a base way to play the game, though you might find your tasks varying greatly from chapter to chapter. I really like the movement system in this game, but I understand some of the complaints, as it's weird to figure out that you need to press a button to get up after a dive. Once you figure it out, though, and the very basic movement combo of jump, jump, dive, recover, you can get some crazy distance and make it around pretty smooth and simply. It's not as tight and full of potential as the movement system that Odyssey brought us, but I find it a lot more forgiving and easier to use, as Odyssey's movement felt way too stiff for my taste, if that made any sense. Oh, and speaking of Odyssey, hat-based movement does appear in this game, but more along the lines of the Psychonauts' psi power system. You start with Hat Kid's top hat, which will focus on your main task, but isn't entirely reliable for getting around. From there you'll find the Sprint Hat for speed boosts, the Brewing Hat to toss bombs and break specific objects, the Ice Hat to turn mostly invincible and perform ground stomps, 
The Dweller's Mask will shift the solidity of certain platforms in order to stand on or pass through them, and the Time Stop, which is self-explanatory and perfectly skippable unless you're going for 100%. Hats are made by collecting yarn of certain types. Once you find a yarn of a specific hat type, every other yarn will just add to your yarn total, and you can make that hat as long as you have enough yarn overall. You can also equip badges to augment aspects of your movement and powers, as well as just stupid things like making each formerly voice acted character speak in Banjo-Kazooie garbles. One thing I find odd is the approach to stages. Each area is unlocked in a very Mario 64 manner. You need X amount of time MacGuffins to open a door, which will lead to a new set of stages. However, the stages within are very linear. When you select a stage, you're tasked with something very specific to that stage, and while some areas like Mafia Town and the Subcon Forest are fairly open, sometimes requiring tasks to open more areas, but the Dead Bird Studio changes vastly depending on which task you've selected. In fact, these kind of changes can apply to Mafia Town and Subcon as well, with Mafia Town completely coated in lava for one stage. What I find annoying, especially for someone who always likes clearing out chapters before moving on, is that the game will not let you into some of these chapters until you've completed others to obtain certain hats or badges, many of which are contained within other areas of the game. So you might have to put the Dead Bird story on hold to head into Subcon Forest, or leave the final Mafia Town chapter until you've created a hat that you can only find in Alpine Skyline. It's sad because there's a very defined story in here, or at least the remnants of one. This game feels like a game that had a lot of content that was cut out, either in the name of streamlining it or just changing the ideas they had, but almost nothing's explained. Like, why does Hat Girl have a house-like spaceship? Why and how did the Mafia guy get up to her window to ask for a toll? Why is there a hatch on that window in the first place? MK sure is a lot of just cartoony narrative convenience, but things will show more and more as you go on, especially during a second playthrough. The most frustrating aspect is how often things will seem to be leading somewhere, or answers are hinted at, but then just abruptly stop and become abandoned. The dynamic between the Snatcher and Queen Vanessa seemed to be going somewhere, but the final confrontation of the chapters basically finished in the exact same way it began, save for an admittedly adorable event, but it just felt like a lot more of the story could be addressed, especially with that creepy haunted mansion level setting up even more story snippets and then just getting completely abandoned. Honestly, I think Alpine Skyline is like the worst offender of all of this. It is completely pointless to finishing the game, and after the interesting story snippets of all those previous chapters, we get none of it. Yeah, looking into Alpine Skyline's history, it was designed as an open world style level, initially pitched as sand and sail. At some point this became Alpine Skyline, that while having a promising opening and some fun platforming challenges, doesn't really go anywhere with its story. Even when it seemed to be leading up to some kind of final boss confrontation, it just peters out unexpectedly, leaving me feel kind of empty after all the amazing things that came before it. And I was looking forward to a boss fight in this area, because the fights in this game are on another level, making even the most interesting fights in Super Mario Odyssey just look like tech demos. The bosses will completely shift in their music, usually with a hardcore guitar rock angle, and they go completely ham with their mechanics and depths to the fights. Mafia bosses fought entirely in 2D, but the projectiles and mechanics of this fight serve as a good intro to just how much more complex the fights are compared to what you've encountered so far. The second boss is my hands-down favorite, from the setting to the music, which I will go down swinging with my claim that it's the best song in the entire game, as well as the fight having the perfect length and complexity of the mechanics involved. It's a varied and very exciting battle that even changes who you fight depending on your performance. Though I honestly think the Conductor makes far more sense as the boss than DJ Grooves does. Conductor's attitude towards Hatgirl and his rival DJ Grooves seem like the logical conclusion to his story. He's such an arrogant perfectionist that him losing one award out of the dozens that he's already won seems like the kind of thing that would weigh on him. However, Grooves' motivation is basically, uh, Conductor probably cheated when he won all these awards, so I want to go back and win the rest of them, and if you don't let me, I'll kill you which makes absolutely no sense compared to how he's treated you before. Most people even seem to get Grooves as the boss because they genuinely wanted to help the guy out and then get rewarded by having him try and murder you just seems like the wrong way to go about this. This boss fight is still a joy to play, and the fight that I chose to accomplish the no-hit boss fight achievement with. I mean, yeah, you can cheese the whole thing with the ice hat if you want, unless they finally patch that out, but don't be lame! The third boss contains everyone else's favorite track in the game, Though mechanically and visually it's more interesting, it lasts a very, very short time comparatively, and it's over before you get a chance to really get into it. Though getting him initially attackable is a pretty clever fourth wall breaking mechanic. Did you just color me blue with my own attack? You're blue now. That's my attack. 
Since Alpine Skyline doesn't really go anywhere, unless you count killing four stationary purple flowers as a boss fight, the fourth and final boss is a showdown with someone who's antagonized you from the near start, and I left out as it's the game's first and major plot twist. But I'll get into that now, so if you haven't decided the game is for you yet, you get another chance to bow out. Okay, so, Mustache Girl isn't that tough of a fight. You'll learn that she's a sociopath, and after taking down the Mafia boss, she learns of the secondary power of the timepieces that you've been collecting. Wanting to use them for basically a different kind of evil, she spends the rest of the game turning everyone else against you, and later steals all the pieces from your ship directly, turning the planet into a lava ball of hellfire, with her judging every character within the game. You go in to confront her for the first phase, and after taking her down, she finally uses her mass collection of stolen timepieces to alter the field that you fight in once again. And it's, um... colorful? I'd like to thank you all for coming out to honor the passing of my video's bitrate. It seems like just a few minutes ago, its quality was so crisp and clear, and the sound was... Defeat her, get a weird, tonally jarring scene as every enemy in the game that tried to murder you earlier all sacrifice themselves to grant you near-infinite health in the final phase, and you'll recover every time feast to fill your tank back up. You have one last choice to toss Mustache Girl a single timepiece to help her take back Mafia Town, with a warning that you may not be able to make it back home. I didn't want to give rise to a tyrannical dictator again, so I kept it and made sure I had a safe trip. But it doesn't matter in the least. Give her one or keep them all, and the ending remains the exact same, which disappointed me quite a bit. Same with the fact that the final shot is Hatgirl sleeping among a group of knit dolls that all look like the characters that she met along the way. While we can take that as Hatkid making dolls of all those characters, it does have the unfortunate possibility of the it was all a dream cop out. God, I hope that's not the case. Yeah, my second trip through this game and world wasn't quite as magical as my first, but I still think this game is extremely charming and entertaining, and more than worth playing. If you own the game already and you didn't know about this, the first DLC is on the way, and it'll be free for 24 hours on September 13th, which hopefully this video is out before then. But sorry for the short notice, this script was barely moving. All said, A Hat in Time still gets a solid Go rating for me. It's a very well-designed 3D platformer, and though a bit on the short side, it doesn't feel over-bloated in its content. Quite the opposite, really. Well, take care, and I hope to see you on the next one. So, uh, no more promises on when I'm making the next one of these. I clearly can't keep a schedule set. I think I'm still way out of my element here and getting this down proper, but if I get back to any sense of normalcy, I would still suggest stopping by my Twitch channel as Weeaboo Wednesday is still going strong. We're getting pretty far along the Octopath, and there's plenty more indie games that I do plan to show off live on there. Follow me on Twitter, where I ramble about nothing until I'm bombarded with British Sony fanboys by heading over to at ChaosD1, or save yourself the headache by looking at nothing but stream announcements and show updates with at IndieStop. That's Indie with a D1. I should probably clean that up a bit, huh? Keeping me afloat are my inexplicably ever-generous patrons from Patreon, where you can head over to patreon.com slash chaosd1 to see early episodes, updates, and future plans for episodes. So with that, I will once again read out my raid leader and higher supporters, Nate McPherson, Arthur D. Gonzalez martin Neander, Kaisme, Sonic Rose, and A. Smith. Thanks for watching and supporting, and I'll see you on the next video. Hey, you know Halloween's coming, right? Not the scrape for horror games in the indie market, I can tell you that.